Greetings to you. Thank you for joining us in this time of devotion and worship. And the theme I want to share with you this morning is The Church of Jesus Will Survive. Survival is a big word that's on all our minds at the moment. But let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come to your word, it is with the anticipation and knowledge that your Holy Spirit will touch our hearts and open the truth of your word to us. We bless you for your word, and we pray that our souls may drink it in with joy and thanksgiving. Bind us together, especially with those of our loved ones who are far away, Bind us in the fellowship of your body, and there will be no distancing between us because together we will praise you, and together we are bound by your Spirit, Jesus, in these precious moments. In your name we pray. Amen. Survival, powerful word. And we're asking, what will survive? What will change? Because we're moving into more lockdown. We have rising infections. We're asking, will it be like the Spanish flu that took 60 million lives? Will we live under some kind of war conditions? As someone said, Grandpa's wor world since the 1914 war claimed perhaps a hundred million lives through all sorts of pestilence and disease and wars, several wars in his lifespan of 70 years. Will we change? Will we change in the way in which we relate to each other? Will our marriages survive? Will those values change? Will I change? Will I survive? And the list goes on. Will the church survive? Will my faith and belief survive? Will this word of God survive? Or will darkness creep over humanity and obliterate everything that is beautiful and good? Now Jesus speaks about the survival of the church. And it's recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. And in that chapter, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus then institutes in this wonderful passage, his church. Let's read it together. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Wonderful question. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gate of Gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here ends the word, and thanks be to God for his holy word to us. 
Let's have a closer look at the passage. And I tell you that you are Peter, says Jesus. And he uses the word Petros. An interesting word because it means a rock. But the interesting thing about it is that it's the masculine form of the word. And one commentator said we could even translate it as you're Peter, you are the rock man, the rock man, the rock man, the one upon whom I can rely, the strong man. And then Jesus says, and on this rock I will build my church. And then the text has an interesting thing here, which I share with you. When Jesus uses the second word for rock, it's a different word. It's in the feminine form. It's the word Petra. Another rock. Jesus will build his church, not upon the man, however strong he is, but upon something else upon the revealed truth that is contained in Peter's words when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. On that profession of faith, that knowledge of God, Jesus will build his church. And Jesus replies to Peter and he says, blessed are you, son, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Such an important statement there. Because Jesus is in fact clearly saying to us, the knowledge that we have of God is revealed. It's revealed by God. It's not revealed by any other source. Our knowledge of God does not come from the machinations of man's mind. It comes from God's heart. God tells us who he is. Now, Matthew's gospel, you see, is known as the gospel to the Jews. And right in the center of this Matthew gospel, comes this revelation that Jesus is the Son of the living God. You see, it's such an important passage in Matthew's Gospel because Matthew addressing the Jews was addressing the unbelieving Jews, the Jews who did not accept Jesus as Messiah and divine. And in fact, that was the very first charge that they laid against him. This that he implied in any way whatsoever that his father was the father in heaven. And in fact, it was the first charge of blasphemy that they laid against him, hoping that that charge would stick and would enable them to kill him. John in his gospel says he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. But Peter is the Jew who believes it, who realizes it, who is given the revelation A theologian by the name of John Ralph, for example, says it this way about this word Petra, the feminine form of rock. He says, to speak of an erring, fallible child of Adam, referring to Peter, as the foundation of the spiritual temple, that is the church, is very unlike the ordinary language of scripture. The true meaning of the rock appears to be the truth of the Lord's Messiahship and his divinity. His divinity. You see, 
on the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Jesus builds his church. And that means that when you say Jesus is Lord, you're laying another brick for Jesus in the structure of his church. You are sharing the building of the body of Christ. Your confession is absolutely essential to the survival of the church. And Jesus then says, And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Nothing will overcome the truth about Jesus Christ. We cannot say it better than the life of St. Paul in his writings. St. Paul the Jew, filled with the passion of wanting to destroy this movement of the followers of Jesus, on the Damascus Road meets the resurrected Jesus. And it's revealed to him. It's revealed to him. This is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's revealed to him. The same revelation that Peter gets. And that's why Paul so clearly says in his writings, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. I want to ask myself and you, do I believe that the church of Jesus will survive? That it will not be overcome by ungodly powers and forces? Or is that a statement that I want to believe? You see, it's so important that when I say, do I believe this, that it's something in my heart, it pulses through my veins, and with all my life, and with all my effort, and all my strength, I show that I do believe that the church cannot be overcome because it is the power of God's oh, love, an instrument of his salvation. You see, there are times when we become afraid and we feel vulnerable when there's the loss of moral compass for example in society and around us there's such a loss of spirituality in those moments the church is often at fault because the church often goes into a kind of silence doesn't say anything doesn't do anything or is loath to do it for many reasons. Sometimes there's a lack of unity in the body. Sometimes Christians are busy building their own kingdoms. And there are many such kingdoms. There's a plethora of prosperity sects in our land. And so often secularism it doesn't have to divide and conquer us or point to our divisions or our inadequacies we do the job for them but god raises up his church over and over again i'm reminded of the story of the russian church, the Russian Orthodox Church. Now the Russian Empire entered the 20th century, as you may know, as the biggest Orthodox state in the world. Around 90 million people out of the total population of 125 million at that time were members of the Russian Orthodox Church. And in 1897, the census showed that there was approximately 50,000 churches in Russia. Amazing. 
But at that period, during that period, the intelligentsia of Russia accused the church of lethargy. Lethargy and a kind of dependence on the state, which implies compromise with the state. Some of the clergy in the Russian church agreed that that was so. The Metropolitan at the time of the Russian church noted in his memoirs, memoirs there was no spiritual fire in us and how could we light up the souls of others when we were not burning ourselves that's an admission i found a very good description of what happened uh, from uh, 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 an editor, I think an editor or a reporter, Giles Fraser, who wrote for The Guardian, and he described it quite well. And I'm going to read it to you. He says, Within just weeks of the October Revolution, the People's Commissariat for the Enlightenment was established to remove all references to religion from school curricula. In the years that followed, churches and monasteries were destroyed or turned into public toilets. Their land and property was appropriated. Thousands of bishops, monks and clergy were systematically murdered by the security forces. Specialist propaganda units were formed like the League of the Godless, and Christian intellectuals were rounded up and sent to camps. The Soviets had originally believed that when the church had been deprived of its power, religion would quickly wither away. When this did not happen, when this did not happen, they redoubled their efforts. In Stalin's purges of 1936 and 37, thousands of clergy were rounded up and shot. Under Khrushchev, it became illegal to teach religion to your own children. Today, the Russian Orthodox churches are packed full. Once the grip of oppression had been released, the faithful who had gone underground returned and rebuilt the visible church in their millions. Now that was yesterday. It's now yesterday's news. It's yesterday's struggle for survival. The Orthodox Church of Russia survived not because the underground church and the faithful said to themselves, we can survive, but because when they were driven underground, they clung to this confession, Jesus Christ is Lord. We will not change and we will survive and we will grow in strength if if we do not usurp the sovereignty of jesus in any way if we do not abandon if we do not compromise if we do not replace the lordship of christ with any other allegiance you see Whenever the church in its history faced a threat to survival, there's always been a revival of the confession of the Lordship of Jesus. And with that, also a revival of the kingdom values of God. You and I know that secularism 
wants to dismiss the church or at least put us in a kind of social lockdown. In other words, a lockdown that says, you go into your compartment and do your thing and don't interfere with how we run the society of the human race. But that will not happen. No, 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 that will never happen. And the reason why is because the church is not a segment of the orange of life. If life is like an orange with all its segments, the church is not one segment. The gospel of Jesus is in fact the juice of the orange of life. One very obvious and present example that we face right now is the challenge that is facing us with regard to the scourge of abuse. And I use this example this morning. But it's not just the abuse of women. No, it's also the abuse of men. It's the abuse of children because abuse comes in many forms. Abuse is like a mutating virus. It knows no boundaries. It knows no distinction of sex or nation or creed. And while the law tries to contend with perpetrators, the church's challenge is in these times to expose, to attack, and to heal the violence that is not just in a specific area, but is the violence in the hearts of the lost. It is the violence within man that is the front line of the struggle. Anything else is a band-aid on the bleeding wound of a nation. And if the church is silent, then that silence is a sin. Our society and our life is like an orange. And the redeeming gospel of Jesus must be the juice of that orange. And for that we will never apologize. Because that's the way Jesus saw it. And that's the way Jesus conducted his ministry. His word permeated every part of their life. Perhaps there's another way of looking at it very briefly. The church, you know, is like a ship. Visualize yourself in a great ocean liner and the captain suddenly becomes critically ill. He's unable to command the ship for a long time. Now, the crew know a little bit about working the ship, but unfortunately, they also become ill. And it's left to the passengers the passengers to keep the ship afloat, to move the ship in the right direction. Unfortunately, they don't really know where they are going and they can't work the instruments like the crew can. And so they sail aimlessly over the ocean. They quarrel among themselves and the ship nearly is out of fuel and since they don't know how to navigate or how to get to port, they can't refuel and things are getting worse and so on, etc. But then miraculously, the captain recovers. And he finds that he can take control of the ship again, but with a difference. Now the passengers listen to him in a different way. In fact, they say to him, you know, while you've been ill and so on, we've been sailing this vessel without your help. And we think we can do a good job. If the church is that ship, we will never say that. We cannot say that because we can't steer the ship. No, no, no. 
Only the captain can steer that ship. We are utterly independent on the power of Jesus for the power of his body. There are times when I feel inadequate, powerless, but God's word says we can, you can, you can steer the ship with Christ. And the word comes to us as a word of power. In Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And obviously the key in the text is through him, through our Lord. This is the faith that you affirm in these times. You can be a witness. You can be a strong witness. You can be given the strength to witness, the strength not to be silent. In Galatians, Paul says, perhaps in a much deeper way, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that text says to me that the living of our lives demands that we live out the Christ who lives within us. This is God's word to us. It is the Christ himself who strengthens his church. When you were baptized, the vow was to be Christ's faithful soldier and servant to your life's end. If you are the church, you believe you are the church, and the word says you are the church, then know this, your testimony is essential for the survival of the church. Unless there is a proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the church will not survive. But we proclaim that. And you confess that. And together now, we will join hands, no matter where we are, not separated by any distance, but joined in spirit. And we will profess that Jesus is Lord and the gates of hell will not prevail. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for strength we pray for the unity of your body and we pray for the courage to speak fearlessly in the name of Jesus Christ. As your baptized Jesus, as those baptized into you, we pray for the constant confirmation, the constant strengthening by your most Holy Spirit, that we will be your faithful soldiers and servants, even to your life's end. Grant us this courage, and we pray it in the name that is above every name, <clears throat> the name that is the name of the Saviour of the world, even Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing these moments. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Amen.